series called Functional Faith. And the idea is we would grasp that our faith, our daily walk, it should be practical. We should be living out the very things that we read, that we talk about, uh, and not just something that we do on Sunday mornings and maybe Wednesday nights. Peter tells us to be holy as he is holy, which is set apart for the very purpose of the Lord. Our walk with the Lord is beyond a one-time prayer. For everybody in this room who has said, Jesus Christ, will you forgive me of my sins? I believe that you died on the cross. You rose from the dead. You're now seated at the right hand of the Father. Romans tells us that that is the path to salvation. From that point forward, I believe that you are saved. Your uh, uh, security in heaven is there because you've confessed your sins. Assuming you walk the walk. Right? We, we believe you can walk away from your faith. We're, we are not a, a, a denomination. We are not a church. I am not somebody who, who believes you can't choose to apostatize. So when I use the word eternal security, I'm using the word in such a way that I believe you're going to walk with the Lord for the rest of your life. It is more than just a prayer, folks. If your faith only consists of a prayer one time at church camp, or uh, when the preacher was yelling real loud and spitting. And that's why he will lift you up. It sounds a whole lot like what we've been reading in Matthew chapter 5. And the, the context, the foundation of our passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 5, which we're going to read here in just a second, is a salvation context. If you read the Beatitudes, which is what many believers in America call Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 12, as anything other than a salvation context, then we've missed the meaning of what Jesus was teaching the believers when he was speaking to them. All of the other things are good, and they are practical for this life. But the foundation, the reason with which Jesus preaches, teaches, talks about these things to the disciples of that day, and it's not just the 12, we're using the word disciple, is those who were following Jesus was so that they would understand they need to humble themselves before the Lord. So let's read Matthew chapter 5 in that context. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I, I'm not going to re-preach these today. Poor in spirit is humbling ourselves, acknowledging we need the Lord. Mourning is our sin. We need to mourn our sin. Being meek is letting the Lord direct us, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That was just last week that we would be so, we talked about Cain and, or I'm sorry, uh, Jacob and Esau. Esau came in from the field and he was so famished that he was willing to give up everything. We should hunger and thirst for the righteousness of the Lord like we would be willing to give up everything. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We stopped there. We'll get into today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These aren't very much fun. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, have you ever studied Jonah before? Like, it's, it's a really interesting book of the Bible. I, first of all, I want to declare here in front of everybody, I actually believe it happened. It is not an allegory. It is not a story to prove some point. I can't tell you I understand it. I, I don't know how you could be swallowed by a big fish. It doesn't use the word whale there, just so everybody is aware. I understand why we say whale, but it does use the, the language of big fish. They didn't have the word whale then. I, I assume it was probably like a whale. I can't, ima I, can't, I can't wrap my brain around how a human being can be swallowed by a whale for three days, survive it, and then the first original vomit comet be vomited back onto the land. Like, that's the story of Jonah. If you don't know it, it's four chapters. Go read it. It's an easy read, and it's a pretty incredible story. 
If you don't know, Jonah chapter 1 starts like this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish for the presence of the Lord. By the way, the word Tarshish is in there because I have a lisp. And that's why that word is in there to make me uh, really wrestle with that. How do you say Tarshish if you have a, if you have a lisp? I, I had to go to, through speech therapy and it brings it all back. It's a whole thing. I need counseling. <laughs> There's a reason why Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. I think if you don't know any of the history or the backstory, you think he's just being rebellious for rebellious sake. Like, I just, I don't want to go do the thing of the Lord. But there's a reason why he doesn't want to go do the thing of the Lord. So you read in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 23, this. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years. Now, Samaria is where Nineveh is at, for anybody who's wondering. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath, Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter. And whether bond or free, there was no helper for Israel. You see, Jonah had experienced the evil, the bitterness of Nineveh and the nation that was represented by Nineveh. So he wasn't just asked to go and witness to any people. He was asked to go and witness to the people that had injured his family, that had taken advantage of his people. It was like being sent into the very people who had injured and butchered your immediate family, your extended family. The people were not nice, and Jonah's first experience wasn't that great of an experience, so he decided he was going to go the other way. And if you look at a map, Tarshish is about 500 miles the opposite way of Nineveh. Like he was, he was going the opposite way. So what... Think practical, fundamental faith. What thing have you gone the opposite way of what God's asked you to do? I want you to do this thing, and it looks like going here, and you decided to go here. That's Jonah. Jonah is just making that decision. There's a great storm. If you don't know the story, and the, the, the sailors are skilled. These people knew what they were doing. They, they, they had been in boats before, and they are rowing, and they are rowing, and they're doing everything to keep this ship together. And Jonah's in the basement of the ship. He's in the, he's in the bow of the ship, and he's sleeping. I, look, I've been on a cruise ship. I've slept through the big waves, but nothing like what they were facing. Jonah is in what is probably a really small boat, and he's sleeping while everybody else is trying to survive, literally survive. There's something going on in Jonah, and these guys recognize it. And they go down to him, and they're like, hey, dude, what's the deal? And Jonah's like, oh, yeah, I'm running from God. And they're like, "Uh, excuse me? Yeah, this storm, read it. Jonah says, this storm is because I'm running from God. So here's really the only thing you can do. Throw me overboard, and then the storm will stop. And they look at Jonah And they're like, we can't do this to you, man. So they go back, and they start rowing, and they start trying to do everything. And Jonah's like, hey, guys, you want to fix this thing? (whistles) Overboard. And they grab Jonah, and they say, when they're grabbing Jonah, Father, God, whoever you are in heaven, you're causing this thing. Don't let his blood be on us. And they throw him overboard, and the storm stops. And, And I can't, I, like... In only a Hollywood fashion, as he's being thrown overboard, I can only envision the whale coming up like in the Hartford commercial. <laughs> and his mouth is open, and he, he like, it's like an alley-oop, right? And he catches Jonah and then goes in. Like, Jonah never hit the water. That's how I envision it. Scripture doesn't say it, but that's how I envision it. 
You can envision it however you want to. 117 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I can't, guys. I don't have an explanation. I believe it because it's in the scripture. It says in, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. He's been vomited up onto the ground. He's back where he started. And the word of the Lord came to him a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. It was so big that it was a three-day walk to get from one side to the other side. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. He cried out and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, you need to know the reason why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh was because he believed they would actually repent. That's what Scripture says. He knew, it says in uh, Jonah 3, I'm sorry, 4, 1, it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I went to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. You see, he wanted Nineveh to get what they had coming to him. And he knew if he went and preached the truth, repent, change your ways, and they did it, God would not do to them what he wanted to happen to them. I, look, I don't understand it. Even after he was in a whale for three days, had a veggie tail choir singing, gets vomited up. I mean, he had to stink so bad. The city turned, folks. The king in chapter 3 hears Jonah's cry and he tears his clothes and he, he puts on the sackcloth and ashes and he calls the city to repentance. And the city repents. It's an incredible miracle. Chapter 4 says there was 100,000 people in the city of Nineveh. 100,000 people coming to Christ. That is a celebration not a, I knew you would do that. But that's what it was for Jonah. And he was mad about it. Jonah's the first missionary to the Gentiles. Go through scripture and, and look at his call. God cares about everyone, even those who don't know they need him yet. Jonah was an unwilling peacemaker. And this brings us to where we're at today. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The context of this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 5 is one of repentance. This context is a salvation message. It's a humbling ourselves. And so when it talks about being a peacemaker, it's not just about being a mediator. Although, blessed are the people who mediate. Being a peacemaker is the one who goes and speaks the truth and people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's what this peacemaker means. Jonah is the first unwilling, he's not the first, Jonah is an unwilling peacemaker. He's sent, he goes, he, he preaches the truth. People come to a place of repentance which brings their soul to a place of peace. A peacemaker is somebody who will go and speak the truth and bring people to the, the, the choice of accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, remember, we have no control over whether or not anybody comes to a place of salvation. Stay in your lane. I say it all the time. Stay in your lane. God's the judge. Jesus is the Savior. Holy Spirit is the one who convicts. It's my job to love. Jesus saves. I don't. Jesus saves. You don't. The Holy Spirit convicts. Not your job. 
we like that job. We like that job, especially when it's not our sin. It's, it's Holy Spirit's job. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. You are an ambassador for Christ. You are a peacemaker. Your job is to go out and be a peacemaker, reconciling those who don't know that they even need to be reconciled to Christ. You are an ambassador. You are an evangelist. It is not my job. It is our job. It goes on to say, now we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. I implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I, I, every week this year in 2020, I have said, you need to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Don't leave here without making Jesus your Lord and Savior. And again today, I will say, if you have never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, do not leave here without making Jesus your Lord and Savior. I am imploring you. I am begging you. I am asking you over and over and over again, please come to a place where you are poor in spirit. Then you shall inherit the kingdom of God. Heaven and hell are real places, folks. And when we come to a place where we grasp, we all believe heaven is real. I think we wrestle with whether or not hell is real. There's nobody who will tell you heaven's not real. I mean, there's nobody who wants to, who, I want to I preface my statement. Those who are atheists or agnostics, they may tell you there's no heaven or hell. But all of the religions are to get us to a, a Hindu, Muslim. They're all to go to a, a better place. We all believe there's a heaven. It's the hell part that we wrestle with. There is a hell, folks, and it's going to be horrible. It's going to be tor tormenting. Scripture gives us a small picture. Words can only give some description, right? Like in the same way, I don't believe there's a really incredible description of heaven. It talks about it, and we understand it, but it's going to be so much better when we get there. Our, our English language can't give us the, the original Greek or the original Hebrew, can't put into context the beauty of what it is. They do their best. I'm not minimizing or belittling what was said. I'm just suggesting when you have an encounter with the Lord, the ability to describe it is difficult. Describe when you were filled with the Spirit and what you felt. Describe what, what happens when, uh, when, when you're healed, when you see an incredible miracle. You can use the words to, to give the picture of what happened, but to convey everything, our words just aren't there. Heaven is going to be incredible, and hell is going to be terrible. And the fact that hell is real and is going to be terrible should implore us to be ambassadors for Christ with the gift of reconciliation, to be the peacemaker that Jesus is describing here in Matthew. Being a peacemaker is your calling. I don't know what your gifts are. I don't know what your talents are. I don't know if you're part of the fivefold ministry. I don't know what, what motivational gifts you have from Romans 12, but I can tell you right now, you are called to be a peacemaker, every single one of you. Because that person at work, that person at school, that family member that has yet to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is waiting for you to tell them because hell is real. Continuing on in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Unfortunately, this is exactly what it sounds like. There's not a real fun spin I can put on this that will make you feel real good. I wish there was. I wish this was an allegory. 
I wish this was an illustration to prove some sort of point, but it's not. And if you check the local news, I'm sorry, check the international news, you will see men and women who are giving their lives for their faith on a daily basis around the world. You, your persecution is being mocked on social media. That is, that's your persecution. Your persecution might be somebody at work saying, whatever, man, you believe what you want to believe. I'm going to believe what I believe. And then you don't get invited to their Super Bowl party. You can go to David's. It's $10. You got a place to go. We are not persecuted for Christ's sake. I'm sorry. I, I read a thing and. I'm not going to share it. There, there's horrible atrocities happening around the world where they can't even they can't even acknowledge that they're saved, much less preach. And the fact that they gather in their homes in what we would call house churches, in what was called the underground church in the 70s and the 80s, probably before that. Is still the underground church today. Different nations, different countries. But the reality of what's transpiring is still the same and it's horrific. You will probably never be faced with apostatize or die. Probably. You will probably never. If you are a missionary in, a, in another country, maybe you will face that. If you are in a horrible situation where a terrorist walks into a church, a school, a, a place of employment, and you know we read about it in Columbine, we read about it in some of these other places where they're told, "Do you believe?" And but most of us, I would I would say all of us will probably not face that when we are persecuted and mocked people do evil against us because of our love for Jesus, there is a heavenly reward. I know that's not very motivating in earth, but Scripture is clear there is a heavenly reward. And the reality is throughout history it's been this way. All through Scripture. Ask Jeremiah. Ask Ezekiel. Read through those books and find out what persecution looks like. Thrown in a well. mocked, beaten. I mean, Paul was doing it to believers before he decided to give his life to the Lord. Stephen, New Testament, guys. Paul's standing there, holding the coats, standing with approval. Yep. As every stone takes the life of Stephen. People have been mocked and brutally killed for their faith for years. And Jesus... And his love and his grace for us declares, stand strong, be competent. There is a heavenly reward. And no, it's not you. It's me they're persecuting. Hebrews 11 is incredible. The hall of faith, as it's sometimes called, except till you get to the end. Oh my goodness, the end? I would like to take out the last five verses. Women received their dead, raised to life. This is verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. That means people died. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They might obtain a better resurrection. The deliverance would have been apostatizing, in case anybody wants to know. Still, others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. The world was not worthy of those who were willing to give everything for Jesus. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all these have obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, they should not be made perfect apart from us. 
Jesus Christ is the answer, folks. Jesus Christ is the only way. I don't really want to endure what they endured. I've, as a youth pastor, I would often present those situations to the teenagers. What would you do? Where's our line of sin at? We, we, we have one, right? I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious. What, to, to the adults in the room, it's probably better put like this. What's the amount of money you need? Where's that line, the amount of money where you'll forego your faith? Five million? And you're going to a country where you're not going to be in trouble? Ten million? Two million? One million? Like, there are, there are adults who can be bought. What, what's, where's, your, where's your line in the sand at? And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated... His disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. By the way, let me just add, that persecution is for righteousness' sake. You don't have to live a life of persecution just because somebody's persecuting you. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about you're being persecuted for your faith. If you're being abused or you know of situations where abuse is happening, that is not what this is talking about. And nobody should be bound or, or feel like the preacher said, i got to continue to be submitted to that, because that is not what I'm saying. This persecution is the persecution of our faith. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Our functional faith, our practical living, these verses that I just read are a physical description of what it looks like to be a believer in Christ. And so each week I've said, how do you fit the bill? Are you poor in spirit? Are you merciful? Are you a peacemaker? Do you mourn your sin? Or are you like, I'm good. I mean, he's already forgiven me. That's what the preacher says every, every week. Like, he's forgiven all my sins. I do believe that. I do believe he's forgiven all my sins. But I still got to come to a place of repentance. Not once. All the time. Humbling myself before the Lord. Are you hungering and thirsting for the things of the Lord are you pure? Are you set apart for his kingdom? Are you a peacemaker? Are you willing to be persecuted if necessary? Remember our ward, our reward is eternal. And we must keep our eyes on him. For this is what it looks like to be a believer. And if you see something else, or you hear somebody preaching something else, call him on it. Call her on it. I see some pretty dumb things right now on our televisions and our social media and our news outlets that make me sick to my stomach. Because they're trying to represent me, and they're not. And they're trying to represent you, and they're not. But do you know that they're not? I read in Leviticus today, this is not in the message, obviously. The sacrifices for the unintentional sins. I want you to have knowledge. I want you to know who you are in Christ. I want you to understand what you believe and for your faith to be practical. 
so that you aren't somebody who's functioning in unintentional sin. Not that I want you to intentionally sin, but ignorance is not an excuse. Not in our life. It's not an excuse. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 12 is a description of what you and I should look like. And as I close today, as, I, as I'm about to pray, my prayer is you would evaluate, does this look like you? And if not, what adjustments need to be made so that it will? Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for these four lives who were baptized today, who are excited about their service to you, Lord. Let today be a day where they hear this message and and they recognize that this is what it's going to look like moving forward, but not just those who were baptized, everybody who hears this message today. Lord, you are faithful, and this is what you're calling us to, and the promise is eternal life, and I'm ready. I'm thankful. Lord, if there's anybody in this room who is yet to call out to you as Lord and Savior, I pray something today prick their heart and that they will make a decision to come to know you as Lord and Savior. Whether that's right now where they come up and they say, I need to make that prayer, or it's later on today as they're driving home, or or maybe even tonight as the football game is on. That they just can't get away from the truth that they recognized their sin in their life and they want to make it right. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. In your name I pray, Jesus.